The woman considers her position as worker transitory to be thrown aside for the first bidder. This is why it is infinitely harder to organize women than men. Why should I join a union? I'm going to get married and then I'm going to have a home. Has she not been taught from infancy to look upon that as her ultimate calling? She learned soon enough that the home, though not so large a prison as a factory, has more solid doors and bars. It has a keeper so faithful that naught can escape him. The most tragic part, however, is that the home no longer frees her from wage slavery. It only increases her task. According to the latest statistics submitted before a committee on labor and wages and congestion of population, 10% of the wage workers in New York City alone are married. Yet they must continue to work at the most poorly paid labor in the world. Add to this horrible aspect of drudgery of housework and what remains of the protection and glory of the home. As a matter of fact, even the middle class girl in marriage cannot speak of her home, since it is the man who creates her sphere. It is not important whether the husband is a brute or a darling. What I wish to prove is that marriage guarantees woman a home only by the grace of her husband. There she moves about in his home year after year until her aspect of life and human affairs becomes a flat, narrow, and drab as her surroundings. Small wonder if she becomes a nag, petty, quarrelsome, gossipy, unbearable, thus driving the man from the house. She cannot go if she wanted to. There is no place to go besides a short period of married life, of complete sender, render of all faculties, absolute incapacitates the average woman for the outside world. She becomes reckless in appearance, clumsy in her movements, dependent in her decisions, cowardly in her judgment, a weight and a bore, which most men grow to hate and despise. Wonderfully inspiring atmosphere for the bearing of life. Is it not? <laughs> so, um, Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. We need to stand up, have a workers' revolution, take the, farmers, uh, take the factories over, sit down, strike. When's the TARC going to strike? When's the TARC and the garbage workers going to strike? As soon as Louisville, TARC, and Louisville garbage workers strike, the whole city will be shut down and we'll get whatever it is that we want to get. Whatever they are demanding is what we'll get. So hopefully they're demanding something for more than just themselves. If not, I'm sure they're they got a decent life. I'm sure they got an okay position. Eugene Debs, who's in the same generation as uh, Emma Goldman, he says I'm opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. And where millions of men and women, women will work all the days of their lives to cure barely enough for a wretched existence. That's um, Eugene Deb. So in America, one person can do absolutely nothing and amass a fortune where millions of men and work at, women can toil for absolutely nothing. So some other statistic in 2010, two years ago in America, 290. 93% of all new income created in the previous year went to the top 1%. So 93% of new income went to the 1%. The Internet can be revolutionary. The Internet can make us more democratic. But it also, what we're seeing with the Internet is that a lot of the good ideas, the money-generating ideas of the Internet are being sold to the corporations. So, again, the corporations are taking a hold of some media that could be very democratic and they're keeping it for themselves. They're having a, a tight lock on the information and what is distributed out to everybody else. And it's become an infotainment. People want to see their information surrounded by a bunch of entertaining ads and whatnot. It's infotainment. I told that to the uh, Cardinal Media people. Infotainment. To be entertaining. It's like, well, like, what do you have in mind? Whatever the fuck you want to have in mind, just make it fucking entertaining. It's fucking boring, stupid shit. Nobody's watching your stupid fucking bullshit. You think you're all messaging. You're clearly fucking bullshitting everybody. It's clear that you don't give a shit about anybody else, and you're only putting out propaganda to cover your own fucking ass. Anybody who doesn't have one sense in their head will be fooled by your fucking bullshit. SGA, U of L, SGA. Ugh. So, um, but the child, okay, so a woman's living in this loveless marriage, but the child, how is it to be protected if not for marriage? After all, is not that the most important consideration, what, how the children are being raised? 
the, shipa the shame and the hypocrisy of it all. Mary's protecting the child, yet thousands of children destitute and are homeless. Mary's protecting the child, yet orphan asylums and re reformatories are overcrowded. Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children keeping busy and rescuing the little victims from loving parents to place them under more loving care. The Jerry Society, oh, the mockery of it. Marriage may have the power to bring the horse to water, but has it ever made him drink? The law will place the father under arrest and put him in convict's clothes, but has that ever stilled the hunger of the child? Throw the father into jail, but that, does that give food for the child? If the parent has no work or if he hides his identity, what does marriage do then? It invokes the law to bring the man to justice, to put him safely behind closed doors. His labor, however, goes not to the child, but to the state. So the state takes the man, puts him in prison, and takes the money from that man to put it in their, their coffers. And what about the child? The child receives but a blighted memory of his father's stripes. Oh, yeah, my dad's in jail. He's a new Jim Crow. Now he's a, he's a slave for the state. And they're charging him for it. It's private prisons. Kentucky, we're number one in the entire country for private prisons. We got more private prisons than everybody else when we need to be spending our money on education and health care and social needs. We need to be caring about the people. If the government's not spending any money for the people, what's the point of government? Why do we have a government? The government is not giving a shit about our health. If they don't care about our education, if they don't care about our lives, health is life, education is our mind. So if they don't care about our life and they don't care about our mind, are we going to assume that they give a fuck about anything else? That they actually give a shit about our freedom? That the military is actually there for our defense? They're not just going for their empire and taking over other countries and allowing corporations to run roughshod over them? Is that what we're supposed to assume? So... As in the protection of the woman, herein lies the curse of marriage. Not that it really protects her, but the very idea is so revolting, such an outrage and insult on life, so degrading, degrading to human dignity as to forever condemn this parasitic institution. It is like that other paternal arrangement, capitalism. It robs man of his birthright, stunts his growth, poisons his body, keeps him in ignorance and poverty and dependence, and then institutes charities that thrive on the last vestige of man's self-respect. The institution of marriage makes a parasite of woman, an independent, an absolute dependent. It incapacitates her for her life's struggles, annihilates her social consciousness, and paralyzes her imagination and imposes its gracious protection, which is in reality a snare, a travesty on human character. If motherhood is the highest fulfillment of woman's nature, what other protection does it need save love and freedom? Marriage but defiles, outrages, and corrupts her fulfillment. Does it not say to women, only when you follow me shall you bring forth life? Does it not condemn her to the block? Does it not degrade and shame her if she refuses to buy her right to motherhood by selling herself? Does not marriage only sanction motherhood even though conceived in hatred and compulsion? Yet if motherhood be a free choice of love, of ecstasy, of defiant passion, does it not place a crown of thorns upon an innocent head and carve in letters of blood the hideous epithet bastard were marriage to contain all the virtues claimed for it, its crimes against motherhood would ex exclude it forever from the realm of love. Love, the strongest and deepest element in all of life, the harbinger of hope, of joy, of ecstasy. Love, the defier of all laws, of all conventions. Love, the freest, mo po most powerful molder of human destiny. How can such an all-compelling force be synonymous with that poor little church and state begotten weed? That is called marriage. Free love, as if love is anything but free. Man has bought brains, but in all the millions in the world have failed to buy love. Man has subdued bodies, but all the power on earth has been unable to subdue love. Man has conquered whole nations, but all his armies cannot conquer love. Man has changed and fettered the spirit, but he has been utterly helpless before love. High on the throne with all the splendor and pomp his gold can command. Man is yet poor and desolate. If love passes him by, and if it stays, the poorest hovel is radiant with warp, with life and color. Thus, love has the magic power to make a, of a beggar a king. Yes, love is free. It can dwell in no other atmosphere. In freedom, it gives itself unreservedly, abundantly, and completely. 
Freedom and love is necessary for each other. Freedom needs love, and love needs freedom. In freedom, love is given unreservedly, abundantly, completely. All the loves on the statues, all the courts in the universe cannot tear it from the soil. Once love has taken root, if, however, the soil is sterile, how can marriage make it bear fruit? It is like the last desperate struggle of fleeting life against death. Love needs no protection. It is its own protection. So long as love begets life, no child is deserted or hungry or famished for the want of affection. I know this to be true. I know women who became mothers in freedom by the men they love. Few children in wedlock enjoy the care, the protection, the devotion free motherhood is capable of bestowing. The defenders of authority dread the advent of a free motherhood lest it will rob him of their prey. Who would fight wars? Who would create wealth? Who would make the policeman the jailer if a woman were to refuse the indiscriminate breeding of children? The race, the race, shouts the king, the president, the capitalist, the priest. The race must be preserved. The woman be degraded to a mere machine, and the marriage institution is our only safety valve against the pernicious sex awakening of women. But in vain, these frantic efforts to maintain a state of bondage, in vain, too, the edicts of the church, the mad attacks of rulers, in vain, even the arm of the law. Woman no longer wants to be a party to the production of a race of sickly, feeble, decrepit, wretched human beings who have neither the strength nor moral courage to throw off the yoke of poverty and slavery. Instead, she desires fewer and better children, begotten and reared in love and through free choice, not by compulsion, as marriage imposes. Our pseudo Moralists have yet to learn the deep sense of responsibility toward the child that love and freedom has awakened in the breast of woman. Rather, would she forego forever the glory of womanhood than bring forth life in an atmosphere that breathes only destruction and death? If she does become a mother, is to give to that child the deepest and best her being can yield. To grow with the child as her mother, she knows that in the manner alone can she help build true manhood and womanhood. True manhood and womanhood comes from the true love of motherhood. Ibsen must have had a vision of a free mother when, with a master stroke, he portrayed Mrs. Alvin. She was the ideal mother because she had outgrown marriage and all its horrors, because she had broken her chains and set her spirit free to soar until it returned a personality, regenerated and strong. Alas, it was too late to rescue her life's joy, her Oswald, but not too late to realize that love and freedom is the only condition of a beautiful life. Those who, like Mrs. Alving, have paid with blood and tears for their spiritual awakening repudiate marriage as an imposition, a shallow, empty mockery. They know whether love lasts but one brief span of time or for eternity, it is the only creative, inspiring, elevating basis for a new race, a new world. Our present pygmy state Love is indeed a stranger to most people. Misunderstood and shunned, it rarely takes root, or if it does, it sooner withers and dies. It is delicate fiber, cannot endure the stress and strain of the daily grind. Its soul is too complex to adjust itself to the slimy wolf of our social fabric. It weeps and moans and suffers with those who have need of it, yet lack the capacity to rise to love's summit. Someday, someday men and women will rise, they will reach the mountain peak, they will meet big and strong and free, ready to receive, to partake, and to bask in the golden rays of love. What fancy, what imagination, what poetic genius can foresee even approximately the potentialities of such a force in the life of men and women? If the world is ever to give birth to two, two if the world is ever to give birth to true companionship and oneness, and not marriage, but love will be the parent. <laughs> so I'm going saying true love, true companionship, oneness, love of you, myself, and the world. That oneness, that sense of oneness, that sense that we're all together in this life, this struggle, this whatever you want to call it. That oneness is the basis for love. And so the world is to ever give birth to true companionships and oneness, not marriage. So love will have to be a parent of that world. Love will be the parent of the new world, not marriage. Love will be the parent of the new world. Marriage is a symbol of the love, but sometimes marriage can ruin the love or can en enhance it. So.
Emma Goldman on Marriage and Love.